And welcome back to Polka Dot Decoded. Next up, we're going to hear from Tim and Louis from Koto Studio on building a decentralized brand for Polkadot. This is a really great follow-on to the talk that Raul just gave. Uh, as, as he mentioned during his talk, the uh, Polkadot rebrand was actually the very first bounty placed on chain, approved by the council, and is being funded uh, through community funds. Um, so really looking forward to a sneak preview of the work that's be, been done uh, by Louis and the team at Koto in collaboration with uh, several of the bounty curators from the, cur from the community, including uh, representatives from Akala, Moonbeam, Parity Technologies, and the Web3 Foundation. Louis and Tim, welcome to Polkadot Decoded. Cool. Thanks. Hi, I'm Tim, and next to me is Louis. Um, very excited to be talking about the work that we've been doing with uh, on the Polkadot brand. Essentially, we're looking to uh, think about how we develop the brand and move it forward. Um, as Peter just said, we're working on a bounty. So we, we've essentially submitted the bounty back in January. If you want to check out um, our bounty proposal, you can look on Pokal Assembly or listen to kind of Raoul's talk in terms of how it's done. But we're going to just dig in and give you some of the insights and some of the things we've kind of been exploring um, throughout this process so far. I think the first thing we wanted to talk about is what is a decentralized brand? Um, when you think about uh, what a brand is, I think most people get a kind of clear idea in their heads as to what that means. But when you're talking about a decentralized brand, it's driven by the community. So the community is what is driving that forward. It may have a name, a narrative, a kind of story behind it, and a kind of um, some visual assets. But essentially, the community is what is taking hold of that. There's no one centrally managing it, taking, uh, looking after it, or giving kind of clear guidance exactly which direction it should go in. So we're going to take you through, now we kind of understand roughly what we're talking about when we're talking about a decentralized brand. We're going to take you through kind of these three questions that we've been kind of asking ourselves and interrogating as we've gone through the kind of uh, the bounty process so far. So the first one, we're very familiar as a kind of branding agency is dealing with kind of traditional brands. So uh, this is kind of our territory that we're really comfortable with, but we've kind of been exploring what that means when you're creating a decentralized brand and what that actually means for Polkadot in particular. So when you start to take a look at what a modern tech brand is, I think uh, everyone kind of could look on the high street or at home in their, uh, on the kind of internet and you kind of understand what a tech brand kind of is today. Essentially, when we think of it from a branding perspective, at the center of it, there's a kind of str strategic idea or kind of um, thought that uh, kind of guides all of the kind of outputs, whether they're kind of the logo, the color palette, the typeface, the kind of visual communications. It's really about understanding what that idea is and articulating to the world. This is then managed by you know, kind of central place by a brand team. They kind of have rigorous guidelines. They have people all over the world making sure that things are translated in the right way and that it's executed across every kind of touch point from events to kind of emails. But when you start to think about it in the sense of a blockchain brand, some of those assets are really similar. So you kind of you still need a logo, you still need a color palette. Typeface is slightly different as it kind of has to be embodied by the community. But essentially, all of those things um, are a little bit looser. The community really needs to be able to take hold of those in a decentralized way and start to build things themselves. So it's less about creating rules and really about how we can create something that the community takes hold of and really kind of lives and breathes. This is kind of a summary of kind of three things that I think Branding has kind of evolved from what used to be kind of a visual identity to be meaning a lot more to be, uh, how it's kind of expressed. So when we're talking about holistic brand experience, it's really about how that feels when you kind of encapsulate um, or experience the brand at any kind of point. So making sure that whether you're um, receiving a kind of an email from Polkadot or you're um, going to an event, that the feeling that you get from that needs to feel consistent and that it doesn't feel jarring or kind of strange in any way. When we're talking about design-led, it's that kind of investment piece, making sure that um, all the details are really considered and the audience um, are really thought of when you're um, executing. And then a strong community, um, making sure that, especially in a decentralized brand, you have that strong community. And that's what's really different about a decentralized brand con compared to a kind of tech brand that's kind of global. When you look at uh, kind of how a traditional tech brand works and engages with the community, they allow everyone to play in their game, but you have to follow the rules. You have to make sure that you're behaving in the right way, you're following their guidelines, you're not using any of the assets in the wrong way, and if you do, they might reprimand you or take down whatever you're doing. Whereas when you're dealing with a decentralized brand, 
this is a kind of analogy, but it's a bit more of a democracy. Everyone can have a voice. It's more, if you want to join the game, you get the, you get the ball and you can do whatever you want with it. It's kind of taking hold of those things and really living and breathing them however you see fit and kind of taking it on its own journey. So we start thinking about like, if Polkadot is a decentralized brand that's led by the community, what do we actually need to create? What are the things that are actually going to help people um, go out there and spread the word of Polkadot, make it feel kind of coherent across all of the different touch points, and kind of live and breathe what Polkadot is to the kind of outside world? So we started thinking kind of outside of our usual kind of realms of brands and started to think about things that um, are experiences and are associated with things um, that, uh, such as like, uh, essentially like cultural movements like punk. Everyone kind of understands uh, what punk means. Um, you know, it started off decades ago, but at the same time, everyone really understands what punk means in today's world. And the reason that people understand that is the threads that uh, punk created right from the beginning all the way through to now, uh, uh, some of them have kind of remained consistent. So things like the clothes people wear, the hairstyles, um, the music, uh, the kind of attitude that's associated with it are the things that really uh, kind of resonate and have allowed punk to kind of span decades and really create something that's global and connects to people on not only a kind of uh, music level, but also on an emotional level and uh, build deep meaning into actually what punk is. Another example of something we kind of looked at was kind of social movements and how they allow people who are all over the world in a decentralized sense to really take hold of something and kind of um, stand for it. And uh, Extinction Re Rebellion is a great example of how people have really allowed the conversation around the environment to be uh, a global one in a kind of consistent and thought about way. So the things that they've done really well are having this consistent kind of emblem that anyone can kind of replicate, whether you're cutting it into the back of your hair or drawing it on a placard, you can create that yourself and everyone will recognize it globally as the symbol for Extinction Rebellion. They've got values at the heart. So there's a, there's a set of values that um, Extinction Rebellion believes in that the community have adopted and um, everyone kind of stands behind. But then there's kind of local initiatives. So everyone is uh, globally thinking about what is important to them in relation to Extinction Rebellion and kind of setting their own cause and really thinking about it in their own way. And one of the tools for them to do that is making sure that there's a central hub where people can download assets, learn a little bit more, take things, uh, share things. And it's really about how that can be spread on a kind of global level. So when we've been thinking about what would make a successful brand for Polkadot, what are the things that we actually need to create and what's actually going to be useful? Because if we set out a kind of brand guidelines in that normal kind of tech sense, it's not something that the community is actually going to use. It, they, people are going to ignore it and go off and do something else. So what's going to remain kind of consistent for Polkadot and how are, how are we going to bring everyone together to make sure that Polkadot's message is brought out and articulated in a great way? So the first thing we've been thinking about is this kind of narrative piece where how do we tell the story of Polkadot? What, what does it stand for? What are the values? Um, and what are the things that community can get kind of behind? The second part we've been thinking about is like, how do you make it simple? How can you start to like recreate things? Um, what are the visual motifs? You know, pink is something that's been uh, with Polkadot from the beginning, the Polkadots themselves from the white paper. Thinking about these things and how they can start to be brought to life by the community in a really kind of strong way and where the kind of equity for Polkadot at the moment stands. And then the last one um, is that, that piece of giving people things they need. So we don't want to create a brand where there's a bunch of stuff that just kind of sits in a file somewhere. We need to create stuff that people will, will take hold of, they'll experiment with, they'll drive forward um, and move on as well. It's not something that will be static or uh, kind of remain stagnant in any way. We wanted to just touch on like a bad example of how community uh, has been involved in a project. I, I think. Some people may be familiar with Boating McBoatface, which was an initiative uh, from the UK government to name an Arctic explorer vessel, um, which kind of backfired a bit. Um, after a, kind of two days of polling and asking the public uh, to come up with names, uh, someone came up with Boating McBoatface as a name. And then the public got behind it, voted for it, um, and it obviously is a great name. It's catchy. Everyone kind of thought it was fun. But the kind of people behind uh, that poll kind of stepped back and said, oh, we, we can't call it Boaty McBoatface. So and kind of reneged on the community, 
decided to call it something else. And I think there's a lesson there to be learned that whatever we create needs to be meaningful to the community. And we can't do something like this. Uh, the community will just ignore it. It's, it's about making sure that whatever we create has meaning um, and uh, is embodied by the people it really found. It's more about how you represent all those different voices. And of course, it's such a wide set of people. It's a really rich community. You can see a few kind of, uh, just the other day, all the people who are kind of tweeting and getting very involved, having their voices heard, making sure that how as we as a branding agency can make sure that these voices are represented, these voices are kind of um, reflected, as well as um, we are communicating really uh, effectively to them. One thing was the kind of embarrassment of riches we had with um, kind of the things to talk about. We've got the governance model, we've got the technology, we've got um, power chains, power threads, all these amazing things, but working out how to best communicate them and rather than giving people a barrage of messages and communicating everything at one time, is about picking the opportune moments, throwing one ball instead of a hundred, making sure that everything we need to say is landing and really um, kind of compelling for our audience. Not everyone needs to know about all the intricacies of everything, so making sure that where we are talking to people, we're giving them the information that they want to read in, in the right places. Something, again, we've been kind of grappling with is the kind of coin aspect of it, the dot. So, of course, mass media and the general public are way more comfortable talking about the currency because that is something that is um, a bit more familiar. Everyone understands the concept of money and understands largely the concept of a cryptocurrency. So this kind of um, quite surface level thing that people really attach themselves to, we have kind of need to work out how we talk about that as well as all the other kind of amazing rich things um, beneath the surface of Polkadot as well. But that also comes with a challenge, you know, uh, the technology isn't something that's very easy to explain. I think at the beginning of the project, selfishly for myself, I was kind of doing a lot of research and kind of gaining as much knowledge as I can. It was kind of, you know, it's a complex subject. There's power chains, power threads, bridging, nodes, all these terms that people have to kind of come to, um, come to understand and use. Um, it's really hard to get your head around um, for a lot of people. But on the flip side, that kind of change that Polkadot wants to have, the kind of positive impact, how we want to change the world, that is a bit more immediate. That is quite easy to explain and quite um, understandable and exciting for people on the inside and on the outside of the community as well. We were thinking about where's a good starting point. Of course, the white paper was a great kind of impetus, the kind of um, ingredients for us as we've been kind of really getting under the skin of Polkadot. Um, but again, it's kind of really detailed. It's kind of seven or eight pages of quite complex um, technology. Um, you have to read it a few times to kind of get your head around it. And while this is really positive for um, people who are kind of on the inside and have been there from the beginning and understand it, a little less understandable for everyone on the outside. So part of our job was working out kind of how does that come through in the brand and how can we make sure that we're taking all this amazing stuff and um, using it in a way that's digestible, compelling, exciting for lots of people. So we were looking at talking about the technology, but what about, how do we talk about technologies and what makes the technology kind of different and special and exciting for people? And through that is the possibility. So the positive impact we want to have on the world, what is that kind of <clears throat> end goal, the, the vision for the future that Polkadot is working towards? On the more kind of um, granular level, we've got the kind of spirit, all the kind of uh, playful energy and all the... Um, the attitude that we felt from all the interviews that we did and sort of the external perception of the brand that we need to sort of bottle with the brand as well. And then the energy. So this is crucially, like Tim was saying, the kind of community aspect. So how can we take all the amazing things that people are doing, all the kind of um, initiatives, all the uh, active nature of people and make sure that we're creating something that gives them the space to carry on that stuff and give them even more tools to be able to play with and get excited by. And this kind of came through in a few of the interviews we were doing, sort of grappling between Polkadot being this credible ground, this kind of trusted thing that people are going to be building on and experimenting on and making incredible stuff, as well as this kind of anarchist technology. So the more kind of meme side of it, there's the, you know, there's the decoded side of it, which is quite um, structured and very organized, the kind of credible ground side of it. But on the other side, there's all these people doing amazing things, changing things. It's kind of an anarchist technology at its heart. It's changing the internet, it's changing how people um, build on the internet and changing how people use um, cryptocurrencies and work together. So it's really about working out 
how these two kind of spirits can live together. One isn't more important than the other, but it's about creating something that feels um, uh, cohesive depending on which kind of lens you want to be looking at. That takes me on to the kind of third question we're doing, which is how do you build a brand for an unknown future? Um, traditionally, um, brands uh, and the industries they've been in have been around for a, a long time. Um, not necessarily the case for Polkadot and cryptocurrency is a kind of very fast pacing world. You know, Apple kind of, you know, they know what's gonna be coming up in terms of the iPhone in the next five years. But it's a different story for Polkadot and kind of um, brands like that. Something that we heard in our interviews was kind of one year in blockchain is like 10 years everywhere else. And even since we started the project um, way back when, a few months ago, things have changed a lot. Um, we've got NFTs and all these kind of environmental um, impact becoming more mainstream. Lots of conversations that are um, sort of starting and happening as we've been getting into the branding project. Um, so it's, it's very an exciting challenge to be able to keep up with all the kind of conversations that are happening but it's kind of a different challenge to the one that we're used to where even when worlds do change and the industries do change, it's not quite as drastic or as fast paced as maybe um, blockchain is. We thought this was a really nice quote from some of our interviews where talking about innovation and making it seem quite, of course, we don't really know where the technology is going and where the exciting things are happening, but giving people a horizon to look at as they travel. It's about giving people a thing to keep their eyes on, the goal, the, the kind of vision for the thing uh, as we innovate and move forward and um, create things. That's especially true even as kind of the world shifts and change and people who kind of at the mercy of people who tweet things without fully kind of understanding the implications of things, making it, you know, it's kind of at the mercy of um, these outside influences and making sure that we've got this end goal in, in sight that people can look towards um, while the world kind of changes drastically around us. Again, we wanted to think beyond our usual kind of reference points, and we thought other technological advances from uh, history were really good places to learn from. So thinking about the space race, um, putting a man on the moon, it was kind of this big shared moment. It was a very positive uh, moment in history, I think one fifth of the world's population or something watched it uh, together, uniting humankind in this amazing kind of event. And since then, during kind of popular culture, films, cartoons, movies, uh, it's always seen as a positive. You've got kind of Tom Hanks smiling, saving the day. You've got um, these really kind of positive, emotive things around the space race, even when things kind of did go wrong. And it wasn't kind of uh, the most smooth sailing process to get the man on the moon. Um, now is very much seen as a really positive, kind of exciting thing for people uh, in terms of technology. We didn't talk about the rockets or the materials on the rockets or anything like that. It was about putting a human being on the moon. This really kind of, that's the horizon that people were looking at. And on the flip side of that, things like AI, which arguably more important to us and more useful in our daily lives. But when you look at the mass media, you look at the films, uh, the kind of... Um, the TV shows about it, it's, uh, it's less positive. It's all doom, it's gloom, it's the robot coming to kill you, it's the robot who's breaking up with you, it's the little boy who's creeping you out, it's the robot who's coming to uh, arrest you. It's a really kind of negative, uh, upsetting world in a lot of ways. And that's because it doesn't have that horizon, it doesn't have that positive story that people are working towards that people can resonate with, whereas the kind of space race did. And if we think back to kind of more usual examples and more usual brands that we, um, we can learn from, we're thinking about kind of these other big kind of um, mass bodies that um, are on the kind of forefront of technological advancements. So NASA don't really talk about um, just the materials in the rockets or the satellites or anything like that. You can find that information if you want to, but they're talking about um, advancing humankind, letting people dream about something bigger It's the kind of moonshot for um, want of a better word. Wikipedia, a bit closer to home, that doesn't talk about the kind of databases or the tech behind it. It's about letting people access any bit of information that they want to in the world. And this is kind of how we've been approaching the Polkadot brand. It's like, what is that thing that we want to be moving towards? What is that positive message we want people to, have to kind of um, associate with us and we want to move towards? What is that thing that we let people do 
with this amazing new technology rather than focusing on the technology. We like to think of the technology as kind of, it's the bus, it's not the destination we're going to. So how can we make sure people understand that destination? And that we're going to put a person on, but carving that positive place for people, having that positive place in people's minds, something that they can attach themselves to, was super, super important to us. And that's still something that we're kind of grappling with at the moment and making sure that um, that's the thing that we're working towards uh, in, the, in the future. Um, I think you can roll video. That works. Cool. Well, if anyone has any questions, <laughs> it's all right. Oh. Um, so, yeah, that's the kind of uh, us talking about the Polkadot brand and the journey to date. There's got some exciting things kind of uh, on the horizon and Looking forward to sharing some more of the stuff as and when we can, and it's been a quite exciting process. Uh, but yes, uh, very, been, at least for me, very exciting and uh, unusual uh, process for... Hey, can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. So quick, quick question. Um, I, you guys sort of went into it a little bit, but interested to hear a little bit about your experience uh, dealing with the on-chain part of this, right? I thought it was really, really awesome of you and your team uh, and your firm, that your, your agency, that you were like down to get involved with the, with the bounty process and, and get this thing initial, initially funded on-chain. So interested to hear about sort of your uh, first exposure to that and, and, and sort of working with a sort of team of collaborators on this, on this initial uh, uh, phase of the, of the brand exploration. Yeah, I think it's fair to say that we've never worked on a project in exactly the same way. And I think the bringing it on chain was really interesting for us. I think um, we were excited from the first conversation. And I think um, going through that process, Raul was a big help in uh, talking us through what it all meant and how it works with uh, the governance and um, proposing things on po uh, Poker Assembly. So I think it was it was very smooth. It was quite clear exactly how it was all done. I think um, getting the proposal and making sure that we ticked all of the things off that we needed to to make sure it was approved was important. But um, going through that process was um, yeah really interesting and quite different to how we've proposed projects in the past. So um, yeah, really enjoyed that aspect of it, and, and generally just like working with the curators um, on the project so far, having the weekly kind of uh, check-ins with them. They've been great in terms of um, helping uh, guide the project and make sure everything is staying on track. So um, we've had great conversations, um, which have been really helpful to us. Awesome. Yeah, a couple people in the chat are asking about the origin of the name Polkadot. Um, I can give a little bit of detail there. A couple pieces. They uh, included the Polkadot white paper in, in this presentation. So that was part of it. Gav had written the yellow paper for Ethereum and was saying, like, you know, what color paper comes next, I guess, maybe. Polka dot, but also there's this idea that uh, a polka dot is a pattern with 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 no center, right? It's a, it's a decentralized uh, uh, pattern that that doesn't really hone in to a central point, which I think is one of the big problems with the Ethereum brand initially, and also the way Ethereum operates. It's quite highly centralized in terms of like who everyone looks to for guidance and uh, uh, direction and all the rest within that within that ecosystem. So for, for those asking about where the name Polkadot brand came from. Uh, other question here, um, just generally at, for, for, for folks who haven't been following, how long into this process are we? And what's sort of like the next steps in your mind? Cool, yeah, so we're a few months into it. We've been going through this kind of immersion phase, which has really been about us learning as much as we can from not only the community, but um, kind of through kind of desk research as well. We've done kind of surveys, interviews um, as well with the community. So it's been really kind of um, getting up to speed and finding where the kind of insights some of which we've taken you through, some of them are like a little bit more detailed. So we're nearly get, uh, ready to close the bounty. So we're going to be doing that soon in terms of the first phase, which is this kind of immersion piece where 
Um, it's really kind of setting out the brief for what the uh, creative and visual work um, on the brand needs to be and what it should uh, do for the um, and give people. So we've kind of gone through that and I think uh, uh, at the end of our talk you can kind of see a little teaser of kind of a mood uh, which we've started to kind of delve into and start to think about what uh, what are the strong visual assets that Polkadot has and how can we leverage those and uh, what are the things that people will need to build in the future. Awesome. Thank you very much. Everyone's asking to replay the video again. I promise you all the replay will be uploaded to YouTube soon so you can dive in and pause and, and rewind and, 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 and look in, into all the little uh, hints and Easter eggs as to potential brand directions in that presentation. There's a lot to digest. Um, thank you both very much. Everyone, uh, up next, we're going to break out into our three separate stages. I will be hosting stage one here from New York. Stage two and three will be hosted by my colleagues in Berlin. We'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you.